Hi everyone, it's Helen. Welcome back to Unsolved Mysteries. In this episode, we take you around the world for some truly incredible stories. Thanks for watching. Tragically, there are countless missing persons in the world today, and each is an awful reality for their loved ones. Every now and then, however, something truly incredible happens, and a previously missing person suddenly shows back up, seemingly out of nowhere. Sometimes they have incredible stories to tell, and other times, they have no recollection of where they'd been or what had happened. This seems to happen more often with young children who vanish into thin air, then reappear as though they'd never left, often returning with strange tales that are as strange as they are unexplainable. The oldest such instance of this phenomenon is the story of six-year-old Lillian Carney, who went missing in Maine in August of 1897. She'd been out picking blueberries with her parents when she apparently vanished. A search that began in the immediate area would eventually come to include 200 volunteers who searched high and low in the area in which she'd gone missing. After nearly two days of constant searching, Lillian was discovered in the woods in a dreamlike, dazed state. She was confused, but was able to answer questions. When asked where she'd been, she amazingly replied that she'd been in a place in the forest where the sun had never stopped shining on her. This was impossible as she'd been missing overnight and had also gone missing under overcast skies and was found in the deepest part of the forest where she'd been surrounded by trees and the floor was quite dark. What could explain her experience of continuous sunshine what might this mean about her disappearance and reemergence? This mystery remains unsolved. A similarly strange case is that of eight year old Ostin Angstrom, who disappeared into the wilds near a small village in Sweden called Orsta, southwest of Kolsva. It was 1922 and Ostin was walking along his usual route home from school with a classmate when the two decided to go play together. By 3.30, Ostin was on his way home alone, a path that he'd taken many times and was quite familiar with. However, he never arrived safely at home, and by 7.30, his worried parents sent his older brother Gustav out in search for him. Ostin's classmate reported that he'd left at 3.30, but even after walking along the entire route, Gustav didn't find a single clue that suggested something had happened to his brother. Resigned, Gustav headed home to deliver the bad news to his parents and was shocked to find Ostin already at home. He'd taken a shortcut through the woods when something truly incredible happened. He said that all of a sudden, the forest seemed to burst into life with countless creatures crawling and running out of every tree and bush. Suddenly, everything turned dark quickly as though it was late in the evening instead of the afternoon. Then a strong acrid smell permeated the area. And when he looked up again, he was terrified to see something completely unexpected. Here in his own words, I looked up and noticed three gray objects hovering silently above me 
They were so close I could have thrown a stone at them. The objects were pulsating as if they were breathing and I saw two dark lines on them. A bit further away, over the woods, another two objects were floating. They were bigger and darker than the ones above me. He explained that the next thing he remembered, he was lying on the ground in the dark, a short distance from his home, freezing cold and disoriented. In the sky, a pulsing light was retreating into the night and everything around him had been deathly silent. He then walked into his house to tell his parents what had happened and they thought it was just his wild imagination. Oddly, Gustav said that he thoroughly searched the road his brother had claimed to have woken up on, but had not seen him anywhere. Of the intervening four hours from when he left his friend's house to when he stumbled into his own home, he had no memory. The boy would in later years be interviewed by Swedish ufologists Klaas Svan and Andreas Olsen, and they would get a little more information out of Osten, who would explain to them, where was I during those hours? I estimate having been gone around four and a half hours. I didn't arrive home until half past seven or eight o'clock in the evening. I almost got beaten because they believed I was lying. They sent me to bed and I was bedridden four days in a fever. Probably I caught a cold lying on the road. It looked as if the objects were pulsating simultaneously all three of them, just like octopus functioning. They take in water and move by blowing it out. It looked like the objects used the same technique. They moved in a very elegant way changed direction and appeared to steer with this pulsating. Where was I? Gustav cycled this way while I was lying there without seeing me. I have pondered on this so many times. What happened to this boy? Who knows? Moving on to later years, in the summer of 2013, two-year-old Amber Rose Smith vanished from right in front of her home in Nuego County, Michigan. According to her father, he had been watching her play with the family's two dogs when he stepped inside momentarily to relieve himself. When he had gone back outside, she was nowhere to be seen and would not respond to her name being called. The dogs appeared not long after, without Amber. An intensive search involving hundreds of volunteers and emergency workers was launched to no avail. And the next day she was found around two miles from her home, standing in the middle of the road that had already been searched and staring into space. She was unable to express what had happened to her, but seemed to definitely be in a state of shock and disorientation. It was odd since this was a two-year-old girl and she had somehow managed to navigate her way through thick wilderness and frigid temperatures that had gripped the area that night. One sheriff named Brian Boyd said of the strange incident, it's hard to imagine how a two and a half year old can survive that distance through the woods with that kind of temperature. There's some that aren't convinced she walked that entire distance. Maybe she was dropped off. Those are things we might have to determine in the future. So what happened to these people? Is there some force out there lurking in the wilderness that draws people in? How can we come to any answers when the details seem so murky? There are plenty of strange vanishings out there and they always skirt the periphery of the odd, evading any real answers. 
it all remains a rather weird corner of the world of the weird, and it looks likely that we will be forced to merely speculate on it for the time being. Stories of missing persons are sadly all too familiar. Every city and town can count many awful tales of people who simply disappear, some never to be seen again. But it's quite rare for someone to do the opposite, to appear as if from nowhere, with no discernible past or story. These days, with the help of the internet, such cases are much easier to investigate, but there still remain a number that are unsolved even today. Take the case of Casper Hauser. His story has garnered a lot of global attention for how strange it was. On May 26, 1828 in Nuremberg, Germany, a teenage boy was seen wandering the streets. He wasn't immediately recognized by neighbors and when approached seemed confused and disoriented. He was carrying with him a letter addressed to someone named Captain von Wessenig, 4th Squadron, 6th Cavalry Regiment. The strange letter's claim was almost unbelievable. The boy bearing the letter, it said, had been taken in as an infant and educated at home. He had never once left that house. The boy desired to be a cavalryman as his father had been, and then the letter presented an ultimatum to von Wessenig, take him in or hang him. There was another letter too, apparently from the boy's mother, who identified him as Casper and reiterated that the boy's father had been a cavalryman but had passed away. What was strange was that both letters appeared to be written by the same person. When the boy himself was questioned, it was clear that communication with him would be very difficult. He was able to speak, but would only repeat the phrase, I want to be a cavalryman as my father was, or the word horse. When further questions were put to him, he would simply answer, don't know. He would eat and drink only plain bread and water and refused everything else offered to him. As far as his social skills and personal hygiene, he seemed able to only enact the most basic tasks and was only somewhat literate. It seemed that the most useful thing he could convey was his full name, written in childlike handwriting, Caspar Hauser. Beside the letters brought with him and his own handwritten name, Nothing else was known about him. Due to the very limited information about him, the first assumptions about Casper were that he had been raised among animals out in the wilderness. This was due to his poor social awareness and lack of communication abilities. But Casper's story began to take shape as he grew in his ability to communicate and what he had to say was disturbing. He had essentially been raised in a dungeon, in a cramped, dank cell that was too short to stand up in. He lived there completely alone and slept each night on a bed made of straw. Bread and water were left for him each morning, but other than that, he ate nothing. He'd never left his cage, had never learned to walk as he'd been hunched over his entire life and had never learned to talk. Bizarrely, he claimed that he had never actually met his caregiver in all the years that he'd been raised in the environment. In fact, he'd never met another human being. According to Casper, it was only quite recently that he'd been in contact with another human. He said that a man whose face was always obscured had taught him to write his name as well as how to walk. This person helped Casper to memorize the one sentence that he knew, 
I want to be a cavalryman, as my father was, which at the time meant nothing to Casper. He learned it by rote, memorizing the phonetic sounds and practicing them over and over. The fantastic story was soon in the media, and it didn't take long for Casper Hauser to become world famous for his odd background. Theories began to emerge about him, with some suggesting he was royalty, and others claiming he was a liar. Casper was kindly taken in by Friedrich Dahmer, a schoolmaster and philosopher, who took him on as a student. Casper studied a variety of academic subjects with Dahmer and began to adjust to his new life. However, there wasn't much more clarity around his mysterious beginnings. In fact, the veracity of his claims would be thrown into question as a series of strange events unfolded. On October 17, 1829, Casper didn't show up to a lunch appointment, and when he was searched for, he was found in the cellar with a cut on his forehead. He claimed to have been attacked by a man in a hood. When questioned, Casper said that the person who attacked him sounded like the man who had first taught him to speak and brought him to Nuremberg. Apparently, this cloaked man had threatened Casper and cut him with a knife before fleeing. It was then that Casper himself fled to the cellar, leaving behind a trail of blood. For his safety, Casper was moved to Johann Biberbach's home, a municipal authority. The mysterious tacker was never apprehended, but people began to wonder if the wound on his forehead had been self-inflicted. It soon became clear as well that Casper was not any safer in the Biberbach's home as other strange things began to happen. On April 3, 1830, a gunshot was heard in Casper's room. He was found alive but bleeding from a head wound. He said he'd used a chair to climb up and read a book and had mistakenly knocked down a gun that had been hanging on the wall. The gun went off when it fell, he claimed. What was strange was that the wound on Casper's head didn't look like a gunshot wound. He was moved again and came to live with Baron Van Tuscher, a landowner. It was around this time that Casper began to earn a reputation as a difficult person to be around. He was said to be unpleasant and even abrasive. Both Bieberbach and Von Tuscher were heard to complain about his behavior and character, saying that he was a liar, disagreeable, and vain. In fact, Bieberbach said that Casper was an expert in the art of dissimulation and was full of vanity and spite. His reputation souring, he also lost credibility, which led to even more speculation that the knife attack and supposed gunshot wound were staged in an attempt to win sympathy and attention. These suspicions were strengthened when a British nobleman named Lord Stanhope decided to bring Casper into his home and investigate his background at considerable personal cost. Despite pouring resources into a search to uncover the details of Casper's early life, he came up with no evidence to support the claim that he'd been raised in a dungeon, alone. After another caretaker named George Meyer cut ties with Casper after just a short time in his company, he proclaimed, I have been deceived. And a further caretaker named Ansel von Feuerbach said, Kasper Hauser is a smart scheming codger, a rogue, a good for nothing that ought to be killed. The truth about Kasper's origins will never be known because he died before anyone could unearth what truly happened.
On December 14, 1833, he returned home with a bad chest wound, which he said was from a knife attack in Ansbach Court Garden. When authorities went to the place where he said he'd been stabbed, they found a purse and inside it a strange cryptic note. It was written in mirror code in German, but with grammatical and spelling errors. It read, Hauser will be able to tell you quite precisely how I look and from where I am. To save Hauser the effort, I want to tell you myself where I come from. I come from the Bavarian border, on the river. I will even tell you the name, M-L-O. To this day, the note has never been conclusively interpreted and the person who wrote it has never been identified. It's not even clear if the person who wrote the note had a role to play in Casper's demise. He succumbed to the knife wound on December 17, 1833, dying a death as strange as his entire life had been. His gravestone in the city cemetery of Ansbach reads, Here lies Casper Hauser, riddle of his time. His birth was unknown, his death mysterious, 1833. Despite the time that has passed since his death, his life remains a seductive mystery, inviting both amateur and professional speculation as to the truth of his story. A popular theory near the time of his death was that he was a prince in disguise. It was claimed that Caspar was actually the prince of Baden, who had been switched at birth with another baby. Caspar was imprisoned by the Countess of Hochberg in order to prevent anyone but her own sons ascending to the throne. This theory further claimed that this is the reason that Caspar was ultimately murdered. However, there is little evidence to prove this theory, and it has been dismissed by most historians. In light of the many inconsistencies and oddities of Caspar's story, there are others who believe that the whole thing was more or less a big scam carried out by Caspar himself, or that it was merely a tall tale woven by a possibly mentally impaired teenager. There are several issues that cast doubt on Caspar's own version of events. One is that when he was found, he did not seem to exhibit any of the health issues that one would expect of someone who had lived their whole life in a cramped subterranean dungeon as claimed. For instance, such a long, uninterrupted period of time in absolute darkness should have most certainly resulted in rickets, yet the records show that Casper had no such condition, and in fact, he was described as being rather healthy looking with a vibrant complexion. He was also in good physical condition for someone who claimed that they had been unable to stand their whole life and had just learned to walk. And Casper was able to run and climb stairs with no particular difficulty. It seems that anyone who had lived under such harsh conditions for their entire life would likely have been paler, sicklier, less physically fit, and indeed far more mentally impaired than Casper seemed to be. It has also been pointed out that the letters he had been carrying when he was originally found bore handwriting that was uncannily similar to his own. For these reasons, it's thought that the whole account of his previous life had been a fanciful fiction, that Casper was a pathological liar, and that the attacks he suffered were also lies and the wounds self-inflicted. Indeed, in this theory, the very knife wound that killed him may have been from Casper himself, and he had simply cut himself more deeply than he had intended. Other clues surrounding his death point to this possibility as well. For instance, 
the handwriting and grammatical mistakes of the note found in the garden from the alleged attackers were similar to Casper's, and the letter had been folded in the same characteristic way that he folded other letters he had written. However, for all of the speculation and theories, to this day, no one really knows for sure who Caspar Hauser was, where he came from, how much of his story was true, or who really killed him. And the case continues to be a baffling enigma that puzzles to this day. In an eerily similar case, in 1851, a man calling himself Joseph Voren was found wandering about a village in the rural German district of Lebas, near the town of Frankfurt on the Oder. Thinking he was a vagrant drifter, authorities approached the stranger and asked him where he had come from. The stranger, who appeared to be Caucasian, answered in broken German that he was from a faraway country called Luxaria, which he claimed could be found out over the seas in a region he identified as Sacria, neither of which were real places that anyone had ever heard of. When he was detained and brought to Frankfurt for further questioning, things got more bizarre still. Voren was found to be unfamiliar with any other European language except German, of which he had only a rudimentary grasp, but he claimed to be a native speaker of two unintelligible languages, which he said were called Laxarian and Abramian, with one being the written language of the clerical order of Laxaria, and the other the common language of his people. The stranger was apparently very persuasive explaining the geography of his country and even his religion, which he called Espatian, in great detail. Voren further claimed that he had been searching for his missing brother, but that he had become shipwrecked on his journey and had ended up in Germany. It seems that in the end, the baffled authorities came to the conclusion that he was telling the truth and released him. In 1905 in Paris, France, another such stranger was apprehended when he tried unsuccessfully to pilfer a loaf of bread from a marketplace. When questioned by police, the man claimed in imperfect French that he was from a country called Lisbia. It was at first thought he was trying to say Lisbon and a Portuguese translator was brought in to help police further question him in more detail. However, the stranger did not speak a word of Portuguese and indeed did not even seem to be able to locate the country on a map. The man humored authorities by speaking in what he claimed to be his native language. And although it seemed to follow basic rules of syntax, and have its own vocabulary. No one had ever heard of it before, and indeed, no linguist was able to place it. Unfortunately, the authorities could not do much to keep him, and when he had been sternly warned about attempted theft, he was released. This is another case for which it's hard to ascertain the parts which could be true or fabricated and which will probably always remain a curious puzzle. Another story, similarly rendered muddy and murky by the passage of time and retellings, is a strange appearance in Mexico City on October 26, 1593, of a Spanish soldier who seems to have appeared out of thin air after being teleported over vast distances. On the day in question, guards at Mexico City's Plaza Mayor noticed a dazed looking man walking about in a trance and wearing the uniform of a Philippine soldier. In addition to him being very far from the Philippines, 
No one could figure out how the intruder could have possibly slipped past the high security of the premises, and the suspicious guards immediately detained him. When the stranger was questioned, he had quite a fantastic story to tell. He claimed that his name was Gil Perez, a soldier and guard at the Governor General in Manila, Philippines, and that on October 23, 1593, he had been at his post on high alert following the shocking assassination of Governor Don Gomez Perez das Marinas. Exhausted, Perez had allegedly leaned on a wall and closed his eyes for a moment, but when he opened them again, he was in an unfamiliar place, surrounded by new sights and smells. Disoriented, Perez nevertheless had dutifully gone back to his guard detail until he realized that his uniform was not the same as the guards around him, which was around when he had been up apprehended. Perhaps unsurprisingly, the skeptical Mexican guards did not believe a word of this spectacular tale, and Perez was simply thrown into prison and accused of being a servant of the devil. Perez languished in prison for months until a ship arrived from the Philippines, along with news of the Manila governor's assassination, which had until that point been unknown in Mexico. Further corroborating Perez's story was the testimony of someone on the ship who claimed to know Perez and to have actually seen him on duty on October 23rd, although it was not known that he had gone to Mexico. Considering that he had been detained since the 26th of October and that he could not possibly have known of the assassination since the news had taken months to travel across the ocean by ship, as well as the claims by those on the ship who apparently knew him, the Mexican authorities had no choice but to grudgingly believe him. In light of this information, the Mexican authorities then reportedly released him and allowed him to go home, this time the long way by ship. It's not known if Perez was really who he claimed to be, and indeed it is uncertain just how much of this story is true, if any, or what parts may have been exaggerated or fabricated over retellings. But theories by those who put stock in it include the ideas that he was simply a lying imposter or a deserter, to spontaneous teleportation, interdimensional portals, or even alien abduction. So what are we to make of all of this? In these disparate stories of mysterious strangers who have appeared from seemingly nowhere, do we have in some instances cases of such oddities as time travel, interdimensional portals, and spontaneous teleportation? Is there truly something at work here that goes beyond what we know of our universe, with these people somehow walking the line on the limits of reality, transcending the horizons of what we think we understand of time and space? In other cases, such as that of Caspar Hauser, do we have a true tale of intrigue, or merely the ramblings of a swindling degenerate liar? Is any of this possibly real, or is this all just urban legend, tall tales, and exaggeration over time, with some of these people having never really even existed at all? Who were these inscrutable strangers? Where did they come from? And what did they want? There is a plentitude of questions raised in cases like these to which we are likely doomed to never know the answers to, with the clues fading into legend and obscurity, vanishing just as surely as this mysterious people allegedly appeared.
Throughout time, there have been oddities and strange occurrences that have puzzled us. Sometimes there is insufficient documentation of the phenomena, or there is simply not enough interest in it, but for whatever reason, they are lost to time. Some stories are of strange tribes of people around the world who disappear before we have a chance to learn more about them. An example of this type of mystery is a Native American tribe who it's claimed looked European, even though their culture is now unknown. Although we have historical accounts of such people, the details remain foggy, and it's not clear whose ancestors they were. In fact, we may never know the full truth. In the days of first European contact with what we now call North America, the native people captivated their European colonizers who were mystified by the culture, customs, and traditions of the locals. They were alternately curious and fearful of what they saw in the new cultures that they sought to overtake. The lives and customs of these people weren't always completely foreign, however, and strange accounts exist of native people who appear to have Caucasian features. This band of tribal people came to be called the Mandans, and the first reports of contact with them came from French explorers who were traveling in what is now North and South Dakota in the Missouri River region in the early 1700s. The indigenous people spotted there had fair skin and blonde hair, sometimes even red hair. They were said to have gray and blue eyes, and the women were apparently so Nordic looking that it was only their clothing that distinguished them from Europeans. The French Canadian trader, Sieur de la Verendrie, said is said to have made the first official contact with the Mandan people in 1738. He reported that the tribe lived in nine villages along the Hart River, a tributary of the Missouri. He noted that the Mandan people displayed customs and culture that were strangely European in nature, much more so than other nearby tribes. The tribe was mentioned in the media in 1784, and their popularity grew from there. The Pennsylvania Packet and Daily Advertiser ran a story about the blue-eyed Indians, as they called them, who it described were acquainted with the principles of the Christian religion and extremely courteous and civilized. Lewis and Clark themselves came across the tribe at one point in 1804 and claimed that they were half white, using terms like civilized and polite to describe them. Lewis and Clark also noticed that the tribe's population was in steep decline due to the smallpox epidemics that were ravaging native tribes during that time. They were also likely victims of attacks by their neighbors, the Assiniboine, Lakota, Arikara, and the Sioux. There was understandably speculation about how Caucasians managed to be on the continent before any European exhibitions had reached it. One theory was that the tribe was actually the descendants of early explorers, with some claiming that Welsh settlers had made it to the so-called New World as early as the 12th century. A legend states that Prince Madoc emigrated to what is now the United States in about 1170. A Welshman named John Evans was particularly wedded to this theory and set out to prove it in 1796 by launching an expedition on the Missouri to make contact and study their language in order to determine whether it had Welsh origins. His search for Welsh influence proved fruitless, and he conceded that the Mandans did not in fact come from early Welsh settlers. In fact, he suggested that these Caucasian-looking Indians may not exist at all, writing to Dr. Samuel Jones. 
thus having explored and charted the Missouri for 1,800 miles, and by my communications with the Indians this side of the Pacific Ocean from 35 to 49 degrees of latitude, I am able to inform you that there is no such people as the Welsh Indians. George Catlin, another explorer, wasn't ready to give up so easily and stayed committed to the idea that the Mandan existed and had European roots. He lived among the tribe in North Dakota for several months in 1832, drawing and painting them and their environment. He claimed that the people looked shockingly European, some of them with white hair and light eyes. He also said that they had particularly advanced techniques for building and manufacturing, as well as sophisticated town layouts, customs, and traditions, and were set apart from nearby tribes in their language. Here's what he said about them. They are very interesting and pleasing people in their appearance and manners, differing in many respects both in looks and customs from all the other tribes I have seen. So forcibly have I been struck with the peculiar case and elegance of these people, together with their diversity of complexions, the various colors of their hair and eyes, the singularity of their language, and the peculiarity and unaccountability of customs that I am fully convinced that they have sprung from some other region than that of other North American tribes, or that they are an amalgam of natives with some civilized race. Even some of the legends of the Mandan people themselves expressly mentioned that they had been descended from a strange white man who had appeared to them aboard a canoe in ancient times after an enormous flood had wiped out everything in sight. They claimed that this stranger had taught them about medicine and had influenced their religion, which oddly featured many of the same beats as Christianity, such as a great flood, a virgin birth, and a child born who could work magical miracles, among others. This was noticed by other later expeditions as well, such as an 1833-34 expedition led by German naturalist A.P. Maximilian, who felt that the similarities between Christianity and the Mandan religion were too close to be mere coincidence. Catlin would write of this, it would seem that these people must have had some proximity to some part of the civilized world, or that missionaries or others have been formerly among them, including the Christian religion and the Mosaic account of the flood. Another idea on the Mandan origins is that they came from pre-Columbian visitations by Viking explorers. The first official European to ever make contact with the Mandan tribe, Sieur de la Vendraille, claimed that at the time he had found a strange rune stone with Nordic inscriptions on a riverside near the village. The stone was allegedly sent to France to be studied, but it's unclear what happened to the rune stone after that, and indeed it's uncertain if it ever really existed at all. Unless the stone ever turns up again, it remains just as mysterious as the Mandan. The idea of Vikings in the New World before the days of Columbus has been talked about for some time, with one prevalent and somewhat controversial theory having to do with Eric Thorwaldson, also more famously known as the Red, who established two colonies on the coast of Greenland in 968. The story goes that Eric the Red then abandoned these outposts when the wild, rugged land proved to be too cold and forbidding, and made his way to North America along with the colonists. The theory then claims that the King of Norway is said to have sent an expedition to the New World to find out what happened to them, and that this expedition made their way up the rivers to end up in the Dakotas and other areas, 
after which they became stranded and then assimilated into the native tribes, giving them their Nordic genes. However, there is very little evidence to prove that Vikings ever actually reached North America. The Verendry rune stone vanished without a trace, and then there is the hotly debated Kensington rune stone, which was a giant slab covered in runes, allegedly found by Swedish immigrant Olaf Omen in Minnesota in 1898. In this case, the inscriptions claimed that the runes had been created by 14th century Scandinavian explorers, and although the authenticity of the rune stone is still debated, it has mostly been classified as a hoax by the scientific community. Regardless of where the Mandan really came from, the fact is we will probably never know for sure. In 1838, the tribe was hit by a devastating smallpox epidemic, and although this was a specter they had been haunted by for centuries, this time it was absolutely catastrophic, wiping them out at such a rate that after only a few months, there were an estimated 30 to 140 of them left. With the Mandan teetering on the edge of extinction, enemy tribes swept in and took them as slaves, after which they were assimilated and absorbed. Consequent intermarriage and interbreeding meant that any unique genetic heritage they may have had was quickly erased, and the last known full-blooded Mandan was a Maddie Grinnell, who died in 1971. Since there are no more full-blooded Mandan left, and only an estimated eight speakers of its language left today, it's difficult to get a grip on their heritage, even with our advanced DNA testing techniques, and their origins and history will likely forever remain shrouded in mystery leaving us to merely speculate and debate on it. It is somewhat sad that this tribe disappeared before we were ever able to really comprehend who they were. All we are left with is the tales and accounts from explorers, but other than their legacy has evaporated into the tides of history. They are a vanished people who sowed bafflement and wonder but ultimately left numerous questions swirling about them, doomed to a limbo of superstition, speculation, and rumor. Who were these people? Why did they look and act so differently? And what was the meaning behind their strange ways? To the alien explorers just starting to penetrate this wilderness at the time, they may have seemed to be baffling anomalies, and interestingly, they still are. Everyone's got a hobby, some small way that we like to while away our leisure time. For most of us, these are frivolous things, like video games, or TV trivia, meditation or crafting. But some people are overtaken by a deep, compulsive desire to pour all of themselves into something bizarre, often something that others just can't understand. One of the most fascinating examples of these types of all-consuming hobbies belongs to the postman in France who spent more than 30 years building an entire palace out of rocks that he sourced from nearby. The otherwise normal life of Ferdinand Cheval began in 1836, when he was born into a poor family of farmers in the charmes sur les basses region of France. Ferdinand dropped out of school when he was quite young in order to pursue a baking apprenticeship. He would eventually become a postman, and his life was straightforward and pleasant by all accounts. 
In fact, he was such a normal man that he would most certainly have been lost to history had it not been for his strange hobby. It's reported that he had a vision one day, a vivid, strange dream in which he saw himself building a gigantic, perfect castle. In this lucid dream, he was able to see intricate details of the construction, aware of the placement of each stone. While he was dreaming, Cheval had the intense feeling that it was real, and he knew even before he awoke that it was his destiny to build the castle in his dream. The dream castle stayed with Cheval for many years after the dream itself, and even though it faded from the top of his mind, it would suddenly be present again on a day in 1879 as he was on his usual 18-mile post route. He tripped, and his foot caught on a stone that was a strange shape. Here are his own words. One day in April 1879, I was doing my rounds as a rural postman a quarter of a league before reaching Dersan. I was walking quickly when my foot caught something that sent me tumbling a few meters away. I wanted to know what had caused it. I was very surprised to see that I had brought a stone out of the earth. It was of such a bizarre and yet picturesque shape that I looked around me. I saw that it was not alone. I took it and wrapped it in my handkerchief and carefully took it away with me, promising myself to take advantage of the free time that my rounds would leave me to set in a store of them. The next day I went back to the same place. I found more stones, even more beautiful. I gathered them together on the spot and was overcome with delight. It's a sandstone shaped by water and hardened by the power of time. It becomes hard as pebbles. It represents a sculpture so strange that it's impossible for man to imitate. It represents any kind of animal, any kind of caricature. I said to myself, since nature is willing to do the sculpture, I will do the masonry and the architecture. The very next day, he began the project that would consume him for 30 years, picking up stones as he went along his postal route. He was fueled by an obsession with the hyper-realistic dream he'd had of his castle and stuffed his pockets with stones at first eventually bringing along a basket, and then ultimately a wheelbarrow. He brought the stones back to his home, and when he felt he'd brought back enough, he set out building his dream castle, one stone at a time. He called it Palais Ideal. The son of farmers, he had no knowledge or experience with design, architecture, or construction, but he had his passion. He began the building with a simple waterfall and it would serve as the main focal point of his overarching vision for the structure. He wrote, From then on, I had no rest day or night. I set out to find some more. Sometimes I did five or six kilometers, three or four miles. And when I was loaded up, I carried them on my back. I began to dig a pool in which I started to sculpt very different species of animal with cement. Then I started to make a waterfall with my stones. It took me two years to build. Once it was finished, I was amazed with my work. Criticized by the locals, but encouraged by foreign visitors, I did not lose heart. I had discovered other stones, each more beautiful than the other, in St. Martin de in Trejo and in St. Germain. They were like little round balls. I set to work. He spent the next 33 years in search of the perfect stones, rocks, and boulders for his dream palace. He worked constantly, carefully placing each stone by hand and using homemade cement, lime, and mortar. The castle was finally completed in 1912 
and was 33 feet tall at its highest point and 85 feet wide. Visitors exclaimed that it looked like something out of a fairy tale. It boasts huge support beams and columns and a pair of waterfalls. There are spiral staircases and spires, towers, and mosaics throughout. The ceilings soar and each room features statues of animals or mythological creatures. There are also engravings throughout the castle, one of which reads, 1879 to 1912, 10,000 days, 93,000 hours, 33 years of struggle. Let those who think they can do better try. At the end of the project, Cheval was so pleased with his creation that he decided he wanted to be buried within it. However, the French government would not allow it. So he set about again, collecting rocks to build a mausoleum, in addition to a full-sized Hindu temple at the Haute Rive Cemetery. Here's what he said about the finishing touches that he took to complete this project. Still more delighted with my work, the idea then came to me that with my little round balls that I had found in Saint Germain, Trejot, and Saint Martin Dout, I could make myself an Egyptian tomb whose style would be unique in the world and be buried in the rock just like the pharaohs. I started digging into the earth and I formed a kind of rock, and in this rock I dug coffins. These coffins are covered with tiles that you can remove at will, themselves closed off by a stone door and an iron one. On this underground rock, I built the monument that is 12 feet wide and 15 feet long. The monument is supported by eight walls made of stones that have the most picturesque shape. I worked night and day for another seven years to finish it. I carried the stones on my back sometimes 15 kilometers, mostly at night. Still, to fill my spare time and for the symmetry of the monument, I wanted to add a Hindu temple whose interior is a real cave. And this cave forms several small ones. And in these small caves, I placed the fossils I had found in the earth. On the other side, three giants and two mummies, all Egyptian. And above, there are two prickly pears, palms, olives, and an aloe. You reach the top of the tower by a spiral staircase. At the entrance of the staircase are four barbarous columns. I took another four years to build this Hindu temple. It's all very impressive, encompassing many artistic and architectural styles. And all of it was built with what he gathered himself with his own hands, and all completely self-taught. Not a well-traveled man, many of these designs and influences Cheval had never even seen before, outside of pictures in the newspapers and magazines he delivered in the mail. But he pulled it all off beautifully. It was all so incredible that during the construction, he was known to draw crowds of curiosity seekers, and he had gained the attention and praise of artists such as poet André Breton and painter Pablo Picasso. What had begun as a half-forgotten dream and chance discovery of a weird-looking rock had over decades become a sprawling, immense, and ornate castle exerting great cultural and artistic influence across France. Cheval would die on August 19, 1924, and be buried in his beloved mausoleum, after which his legend grew among artists and architects, especially surrealists, who came in droves to look upon his labor of love. In 1969, André Malot, the Minister of Culture, declared Cheval's palace a cultural landmark, and the structure continues to draw in over 100,000 visitors a year. What drove Cheval? 
what made him so fully devote himself to this endeavor that lasted nearly a lifetime and required true devotion from beginning to end to become an iconic landmark in France. How is it that this uneducated, untraveled man managed such a feat of architecture all by himself? It is all truly a weird historical oddity and testament to the human will to follow through no matter what the odds. What did you do with your free time today?